Aloha and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the third session of Adapting to COVID-19, Indonesia, the United States, and the Indo-Pacific virtual forum series on COVID-19's impact on regional trade and security, held with support from the U.S. Embassy Jakarta and in partnership with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Indonesia. This nine-part virtual series addresses broad cross-cutting issues and that impact both countries. Emerging <clears throat> security issues, COVID-19, regional and bilateral trade and investment, and democracy and civil society. It features American and Indonesian experts with diverse yet complementary backgrounds in, to examine the trajectory of U.S.-Indonesia relations in the new normal. My name is Rob York, Director of Regional Affairs at Pacific Forum International. Please note that this session features simultaneous interpretation. You may access the English or Bahasa Indonesia channels using the globe on the bottom right portion of your screen. Our second and most recent session of the series on March 30th concerned assessing cybersecurity trends and threats in the US and Indonesia. Key findings from the meeting on this highly complex topic included, the US and Indonesia must continue to strengthen public-private partnerships and raise education and awareness through academia and civil society organizations to disrupt cyber criminals. Government agencies can use economic incentives to promote cooperation between larger enterprises and businesses where the former can help the latter in the provision of cybersecurity. Also, as the likelihood of hybrid warfare, that is the use of cyber capabilities and kinetic means continues to increase, there is an urgent need to discuss possible and acceptable countermeasures within the remit of international law. And the US and Indonesia are well entrenched in the application of cyber norms and international law in cyberspace and can lead regional and practical efforts to address the enormous challenges in cyberspace faced by the entire region. Key findings will be available on our website in the coming days at the link appearing on your screen. Our first session on February 24th concerned exploring regional trade and the challenges of the post-COVID-19 economy. Among the issues discussed in that session was the role of regional integration, such as the Indo-Pacific, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RECEP, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the CPTPP. In the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, you can view our full key findings for that event in the link in the chat box now. We'll also post edited videos in English and Indonesian to Pacific Forum's YouTube channel in the near future. Today's session will focus on the intersections between regional trade and security and the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on both. Previously on a clear path to middle income status, export and tourism reliant ASEAN nations sustained a severe blow from the COVID-19 pandemic, with economies contracting anywhere from 4 to 7% in 2020. Even with the vaccine distribution beginning, 2021 has started with border closures and social restrictions, and some experts expect the long-term effects of the pandemic to be deeper and longer lasting than that of the Asian financial crisis. The economic setbacks of and divergence in governmental responses to the pandemic have raised the stake for interregional cooperation, as has the US and China's competition for influence in Southeast Asia. In this climate, the subject of inter-ASEAN integration on trade and security will only grow in importance. As ASEAN's most populous country, Indonesia has a critical role in promoting regional standards on trade, security, and governance. The challenges of this time call for ASEAN nations <clears throat> to look beyond the protection of their own sovereignty toward international cooperation to address transnational challenges from terrorism to refugee crises to the erosion of democratic institutions plus maritime security. This session explores the intersection of these crucial issues, including the long-term fallout of the pandemic, how Indonesia can promote effective integration on trade and security, as well as how to navigate the increasing tensions prompted by the US-China rivalry in Southeast Asia. 
Thus, this session will discuss issues impacting regional trade and security, including increasing competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China in Southeast Asia, the rise of vaccine nationalism, and Indonesia's role in promoting both security and trade. Please note that remarks made in today's program are on the record, and a video and audio recording of this session will be made available on Pacific Forum's website and social media channels. This event is also being live streamed on CSIS Indonesia's YouTube channel. Also a reminder to all of our speakers today, please speak slowly and clearly for the interpreters. I'd now like to introduce U.S. ASEAN Economic Section Chief Juan Camarano to give some brief welcoming remarks. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, esteemed panelists and guests from across the region. For those who are observing Ramadan Karim. Before I begin with my remarks, I wanted to thank Pacific Forum International and CSIS for putting on this event and inviting me to provide some opening remarks. The Biden administration is committed to working closely with our partners and allies, including through multilateral engagement, to achieve our shared objectives of a more peaceful, prosperous, and Yes. Okay. Thank you and apologies, everyone. Looks like I'm having some connection issues. Let me start from the top. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Good morning, esteemed panelists and guests from across the region. For those who are observing Ramadan Karim, before I begin with my remarks, I want to thank Pacific Forum International and CSIS for putting on this event and inviting me to provide some opening remarks. The Biden administration is committed to working closely with our partners and allies, including through multilateral engagements to achieve our shared objectives for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. The United States has been ASEAN's true partner for 43 years now, and we have high hopes for what our partnership can achieve in the region. ASEAN remains diplomatically, economically, and strategically central to U.S. interests in the 21st century. One of the most pressing issues for the region, in fact, for the world, is recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. The United States is contributing to ASEAN's COVID-19 recovery by responding to ASEAN's comprehensive recovery framework, its roadmap to recover from the pandemic. I'll only cover a few relevant examples. Under the Comprehensive Recovery Framework Strategy 1, Strengthening Health Systems, the United States has provided more than $87 million to ASEAN countries to fight the COVID-19 crisis since the onset of the pandemic. In February, the Biden administration announced an initial contribution of $2 billion to the COVAX facility. And through USAID, we're helping ASEAN to establish the Public Health Emergency Coordination System to uh, enable a unified regional response to future pandemic threats. Under strategy three of the framework covering economic recovery and regional integration, the United States continues to be a steadfast partner. Our flagship program to help build and implement ASEAN's single window for customs clearance demonstrates our commitment to ASEAN's economic integration. Finally, and one of the most important for this administration <clears throat> is strategy five, advancing towards a more sustainable and resilient future. The United States is committed to help ASEAN build back better taking into account the needs of our future generations. Through promoting climate resilient and sustainable energy and infrastructure, among other priorities, we can work with our partners to strengthen supply chains and increase connectivity within ASEAN and beyond its borders. But ASEAN also faces issues that have broad geopolitical implications for the region, like protecting the rule of law in the maritime space, fostering the role of women and youth in peace and security, and upholding human rights in the, across the Indo-Pacific. Threats from external forces remain a concern, combined with maritime issues, border control, and political instability. Fortunately, the political security cooperation between the United States and ASEAN <clears throat> is robust and reflects a long-term commitment to building up ASEAN institutions through partnership with multiple US government agencies. As President Biden laid out in his interim national security guidance, the United States believes democratic institutions hold the key to freedom, prosperity, peace, and dignity. The ASEAN Charter says similarly, calling on ASEAN member states to strengthen democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. 
And if we work together with our partners on these principles, with strength and confidence, we will meet every challenge and outpace every challenger. On behalf of the U.S. Mission to ASEAN and U.S. Embassy Jakarta, I hope that all of the participants joining us acquire key information and gain new perspectives from this webinar. Enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for staying with us here. If anyone is just joining us, I am your MC for this event, Rob York from Pacific Forum. Pitriani from CSIS Indonesia will be moderating today's discussion, which will include feedback with Q&A for the audience. Later participants will be allowed to unmute their mics and ask questions or give feedback. Participants' cameras are disabled throughout the session. There's also a survey link for our participants to fill out. We will remind participants of this at the end of the session. Now for today's session, I will hand over the mic to Pitriani, researcher at CSIS, to moderate the discussion and Q&A. Pitri? Thank you so much, Rob. Um, um, thank you and welcome to today's discussion. We'll do the four presentation all together, followed by the Q&A uh, discussion. Uh, this is a friendly reminder for the speaker to keep their presentation to 10 minutes so we can have ample time for question and discussion later. This session is 90 minutes in total. And uh, because we have uh, English to Bahasa interpretation vice versa, please remember to speak slowly and clearly. You may access the live interpretation feature using the globe at the bottom right portion of your screen. Note that participant, uh, you may raise your hand or submit question in the Q&A box as you have them during the presentation. So you don't need to save them until the end. So today presenter for uh, the session, uh, COVID-19 impact on regional trade and security are, firstly, we have uh, Dr. Ami Sirai, Senior Associate for Asia Center from uh, from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS in Washington, D.C. Dr. Sofal Ear, Associate Professor of Diplomacy and World Affairs at the Occidental College in Los Angeles, California. Uh, Mr. Mac Mark Milley, Senior Vice President, Policy at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Fajar Hirawan, researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia. First up, uh, I will uh, call Dr. Ami C. Wright uh, to speak, uh, but first I will read her bio. Uh, Dr. C. Wright is a Senior Associate for ASEA at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. She previously served as a Senior Advisor and Director at the Southeast Asia Program at the CSIS at Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. C. Wright has wealth of experience on Asia, Asia policy, spanning from defense, diplomacy, development, and economics in both government and academia. Most recently, she served in the Department of Defense as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia uh, from 2014 to 2016. Prior to that appointment, she served as Principal Director for East Asia Security at the DOD as a Senior Advisor for Asia uh, in the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. She has also served on the Policy Planning Staff and as Special Advisor for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, uh, in the State Department as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. Before entering government, Dr. C. Wright was an assistant professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, where she taught international relations of ASEAN and directed the, the mid-career master program in international policy and practice. Dr. C. Wright, you may have the screen. Thank you, Fitriani, and aloha to my PAC Forum friends. Um, I was delighted to be invited uh, to this forum. Um, I'll keep my remarks very short. I thought I would um, just give a brief presentation uh, using some uh, data to look at. I was asked to talk about U.S.-China rivalry in post-COVID Southeast Asia. So if you could put up my slides um, that I put together just so that we would have a little bit of... Um, uh, shared data to work with, uh, and then we can use that later in the question and answer session. 
um, if you could go to my first slide, what I just wanted to do was um, uh, ask the question um, about whether the pandemic has shifted the trajectory of geopolitical trends. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that China, although China, the, the pandemic originated in China, and um, China had its own problems in terms of the way it was handling the pandemic at home, um, shutting down internal um, questioning about the pandemic, um, clamping down on, on some reporting internally. Um, but it, China really went out with big mass diplomacy um, in the region of Southeast Asia and globally, um, sending out masks and doctors and all kinds of uh, personal protective equipment um, and seemed to get the, uh, 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 the, the uh, coronavirus under control um, through very effective quarantining um, at home uh, relatively quickly, um, as compared, of course, to the United States, where once the uh, COVID-19 really uh, took hold, um, the United States really badly uh, blundered in its initial response and, um, uh, and uh, took quite a long time. Uh, uh, still is struggling in many ways with dealing with the pandemic. So uh, took a big reputational hit um, in many ways. And so many people started to ask the question of whether this was a real turning point in terms of Chinese leadership um, and, and a rise of China's soft power um, and, and a decline of American image and leadership in the world. And yet what we've seen with uh, survey data, which is what I wanna show, what I wanna focus on, um, is actually uh, quite interesting because um, surveys that have been taken over the past several years have been very, very consistent um, across surveys and over time. Um, so focusing in particular on the, um, the ICS state of Southeast Asia annual surveys, um, going back several years, um, but also if you look at the Pew uh, poll of six Asian countries um, that came out in February last year that included uh, two Southeast Asian countries, Indonesia and the Philippines, um, as well as a, a poll that CSIS did, we did, um, that looked at, uh, that, that surveyed strategic elites in Southeast Asia um, that we published in May of last year. Um, the results are very consistent um, and what they generally show is, um, uh, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I'm only going to focus primarily on the ICS poll. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, it, it shows uh, that China is, is overwhelmingly seen in the region um, of Southeast Asia as the dominant economic and the dominant political and strategic power in the region. But uh, Southeast Asia increasingly views China in very negative terms. Um, so this, this one question from the 2021 poll that was just recently released um, shows that 46.3% uh, that of the Southeast Asians surveyed uh, see China as a revisionist power, which has grown over the last several years, but the number has been high for quite some time. And the numbers um, of the other categories um, that see uh, China as, you know, the, the, the question of whether it's too early to tell, whether China, you know, what China's strategic intentions are, or that see China as a status quo power, those numbers have fallen in this past, in this recent survey compared to previous years. If you go to the next slide, um, it shows over time, this again, using the same survey from ICS um, from 2019 to 2021, you can see that trust in China is eroding over time. So even after the pandemic, even after this mass diplomacy, we can see that um, if you, the question that's asked, how confident are you that China will do the right thing in terms of contributing to global peace, security and prosperity and governance? Um, the, the respondents that have no confidence uh, in China, that China will do the right thing has grown rather significantly, even from last year to this year. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'm going through these quickly. Um, the next slide sh uh, shows uh, compare uh, if, you know, we all know that ASEAN does not want to choose between the United States and China, but this question poses the question, if forced to choose, would you rather align with China or the United States? And again, we see a preference, a strong preference for the United States over China, which grows um, over time from, from last year to this year. Uh, to now uh, nearly two thirds majority preference for aligning with the United States. And this shows that, you know, the favorable, 
favorable views of the United States are indeed rising, even after, even in the midst of this pandemic, um, uh, you know, botched response. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is in large uh, part due uh, perhaps to the Biden bounce uh, with President Biden elected. This is, shows the last three years of surveys. Um, the question that was asked, the level of U.S. engagement with Southeast Asia under um, the Trump administration in 2019-2020 was expected to decrease level of engagement in Southeast Asia was expected to decrease under Trump uh, by large majorities. Um, but under Biden, a large majority expects the level of in U.S. engagement to increase in Southeast Asia. So we see a lot of optimism that Biden is going to be much more of a leader. The administration will be much more engaged in Southeast Asia. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is the kind of takeaways. So, uh, you know, does this mean that President Biden will be able to restore American leadership in the Indo-Pacific and in specifically in Southeast Asia? You know, I think this is um, probably, this is a big question. And I think, uh, first of all, the damage that was done over the last four years when uh, President Trump pulled the United States out of uh, the TPP on day one and the Paris Climate Accord and many other international agreements and alliance commitments, um, I think really hurt the image of the United States um, and uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, the, the fact the United States was not standing for democratic norms and a lot of other things. These are not things that can be put back together easily. And so one administration, you know, in four years, I don't think Biden can completely make up that kind of ground that's you know, going to be a very long-term project, in addition to the fact that politics are still fractured uh, at home uh, in the United States, and there's a lot of domestic focus for a lot of Biden's agenda. Um, there's a lot of you know, fractured politics, a lot of focus on infrastructure and recovery for coronavirus. Uh, there's a lot of focus on policing and civil rights for Black Americans and Asian Americans. There's a lot of domestic issues at play. And yet we also see Biden is focusing perhaps more than some expected on foreign policy issues um, already. Um, so what can we expect about Biden foreign policy? Well, to some degree, there is already, we can see a return to normal in terms of the policy process, much more normal policy process, including on Asia policy. Um, than before under Trump. We see a return to partners, working with partners and allies and working through multilateral organizations um, and frameworks, uh, including ASEAN. Um, and I do think we'll see a lot more engagement uh, with Southeast Asia if we go back to the high water mark uh, that was set by President Obama. Uh, that's the new normal. I think we're gonna get back to that normal. But I think there's some new elements that we are seeing already, a much more of a focus on democracy. Um, I think we're going to see much more of an elevation of, of development, tools of development in foreign policy with, uh, I think, soon confirmation of uh, Samantha Power to be the USAID administrator and to play a much larger role in the foreign policymaking process in the Biden administration. Um, and then there's going to be the big China strategy, which is going to be a, 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 a focus on strategic competition mixed with targeted areas of cooperation on things like climate and, and um, pandemic response, et cetera. Um, and what is missing, um, I think we, and I'm sure Mark and others will talk about this, there is still a, a big question mark around whether there's going to be a real economic engagement strategy. Uh, we still have not, it's still not clear whether there's going to be a real trade uh, policy that would get the United States back to something like TPP or CPTPP. You know, right now, the big trade agreements in the region, CPTPP and RCEP still do not include the United States. And it is still not clear whether the United States is going to, uh, whether the Biden team is going to be able to overcome domestic political resistance um, to get the United States back at the table. There's a lot of talk, good ideas on the table about trying to forge a digital trade agreement and then to move forward with the, the development um, finance um, bank and other things, uh, uh, development finance corporation that was launched, but there's still a big missing hole of economic uh, statecraft, I think, in the Biden team that's not yet fleshed out. And the other final point I'll make is, regardless of what the Biden team does, it's also clear based on the survey results um, that uh, CSIS and, and ICS and others have shown, multilateralism, more, uh, sorry, more multipolarity is here to stay 
regardless of what the United States gets its house on order and becomes much more engaged on a, in a leaderly way on the global stage again, Southeast Asia has made clear that they like having other partners, other key partners um, in the region. And in particular, what shows in the surveys is they really like working with Japan and the EU. Um, they have a little more skepticism around India as a potential partner, but India is clearly a rising power and is going to be increasingly important in the future. Um, they see the Quad, some countries see the Quad as a potential framework that could be useful, which of course includes Japan, India, and Australia. Um, and there are other players in the mix too. Now the UK that's not part of the of the EU, and then there's Korea and Germany. So, you know, the the Southeast Asia ASEAN is embracing these other players in a more kind of multipolar uh, kind of world. And I think, um, uh, of course, Russia is in the mix in other ways as well. And so I think we shouldn't only view the region through this uh, bipolar rivalry lens, but expect to see other players being step, step, stepping up to play a larger role as well, which I think Southeast Asia welcomes. And I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Thank C. You. Right, uh, for that informative presentation. Um, uh, next, we have Dr. Sofal Ear. Uh, okay, he's here now. Uh, Dr. Sofal Ear is Associate Professor for Diplomacy and World Affairs at Occidental College in Los Angeles, California. His research and teaching focuses on global political economy, security, and development, including how to rebuild countries after wars. He specializes on Southeast Asia and is a leading authority on Cambodia. Professor Ayer joined Occidental College in August 2014 after teaching political economy and post-conflict reconstruction at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and a postdoc in international development policy at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. He has consulted for the World Bank was assistant resident representative for the United Nations Development Program in East Timor and advisor to Cambodia's first private equity fund, Leopard Capital. Uh, Professor Ear also served on the boards of the Journal of International Relation and Development, the International Public Management Journal, Journal of Southeast Asian American Education and Advancement, and Politics and Life Sciences. He is the author of Eight Dependents in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. Professor Ear, the screen is yours. Thank you, Fitriani, and, and thank you to my fellow panelists, uh, along with Rob York and Audrey Hap for uh, making this possible on, on the part of um, our partners. Um, and I, I really am honored to, to share uh, some of my thoughts about COVID's, uh, COVID-19's impact on regional trade and security. Uh, actually, some of the ideas will be echoed very much with Amy C. Wright's uh, talk uh, uh, earlier. But I want to begin with this idea of vaccine nationalism and diplomacy as a potential security threat, because after all, the, the idea that a vaccine would be you know, used as as a lever to get countries on your side or to even, you know, allow a visa to be issued because you've been vaccinated by China or a Chinese made vaccine seems, seems really anathema to our usual conventional processes. Um, you look at the uh, phase three cl clinical trials of, of ch uh, China national pharmaceutical group, Sinovac Biotech, uh, CanSino Biologics, and, and you can look at the promised priority access in countries like Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, and you notice immediately the pattern, right? It's, it's China's backyard. It's, it's, uh, it's countries that, are, uh, that it's trying to influence. And the rates, of course, of vaccination vary across the region. Singapore with uh, 25.95 per 100 uh, uh, persons versus Thailand at 0.42 or the Philippines at 0.78 or Indonesia at 4.92, uh, really differing levels of, of penetration of the vaccine, whether it is the Chinese vaccine or some other uh, uh, vaccine that isn't made by China. This will be very familiar to Amy uh, in the presentation that she gave, because it's exactly the point that um, she underscored, which is that there is uh, on the based on the ISIS 
uh, Singapore data, uh, survey data, China is really not enjoying a lot of confidence uh, from uh, the thousand academics, government officials, and and business people across the uh, the ten nation ASEAN bloc um, member countries, and and uh, India a little bit uh, better, but not great. The U.S. Uh, less in the area of no confidence, more in the area of confidence, but it's really. Um, the EU and in particular Japan that has the highest confidence. And I see in the participants list a lot of uh, Japanese uh, names. Uh, so, you know, I think that basically Japan has a reputation for being credible when uh, Japanese uh, investors say we're going to do something. It, it actually happens. There's not a lot of doubt as to whether something is going to happen or not, at least for the region. And the 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 uh, the Sinovac that that's been uh, handed to countries like the Philippines, countries like Cambodia, is really a way for China to bring in closer to its sphere of influence countries that uh, that need desperately to contain uh, the outbreak and and believe that the vaccination is is the cure towards herd immunity. So I'll go through a few of the pictures I've collected. Uh, here you have, of course. Uh, uh, President Joko getting uh, a vaccine, which is the Sinovac biotech vaccine. And uh, here, the son of the prime minister of Cambodia, Prime Minister Hun Sen's oldest son, who is said to be the heir apparent getting the Sinopharm vaccine uh, in these very public displays, of course. Uh, prime Minister Hun Sen uh, getting the AstraZeneca vaccine and uh, Thailand's Prime Minister uh, Prayut Chan Ocha getting um, uh, what I believe is also the AstraZeneca vaccine. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, Muhyiddin Yassin, getting the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, and uh, Prime Minister Le Xianlong also getting that same Pfizer vaccine. Meanwhile, in Brunei, the Sultan of Brunei gets a shot, but it's I wasn't able to determine which brand it was. Uh, there are three uh, authorized for emergency use: AstraZeneca, Pfizer's, and uh, Sino, uh, Sinopharm. So it could have been one of those three, but uh, and I, I could not determine from the press which one he actually obtained. Um, President Duterte saying that he waived his chance to get COVID-19 vaccine, ceding his place to more deserving elderly and having, of course, a bit of a run in with China, which has led to a narrative of hero Putin uh, uh, for getting vaccines to uh, the Philippines in the form of an order of 20 million of Russia's Sputnik V uh, for, uh, for the Philippines uh, agreed upon in a virtual summit. Meanwhile, Vietnam is using uh, AstraZeneca and has negotiated for Sputnik V. Uh, it's the only ASEAN nation that has yet to publicly state if it will use uh, Sinovac or the Sinopharm vaccines from China. Of course, we know China, uh, Vietnam is not at all uh, keen on, uh, on uh, over-reliance on China. And Myanmar has taken the AstraZeneca uh, known there as COVID shield when made in India. In the uh, next six minutes uh, uh, or five minutes left, I'd like to share some of the key findings from a report that uh, ASEAN published uh, thanks to funding from the Asia Pacific uh, Foundation of Canada entitled um, COVID-19 Pandemic Implications on Agriculture and Food Consumption, Production and Trade in ASEAN Member uh, States. And that's the link to the report. I, I found it to be very useful. You know, it, it goes over some of the projections uh, on growth uh, expected in the region. Uh, as we already know, within ASEAN, Singapore has seen a 6.2% contraction in its economy in 2020. Thailand minus eight. Uh, now, in the case of Singapore, it was mostly through trade volume reduction. Thailand and Cambodia minus eight, minus four percent because of a drop in tourism and hospitality. Uh, the Philippines, a general slowdown in the economy, minus seven point three. Uh, Vietnam Delta actually registering slightly positive growth at one point eight percent. And, and Brunei uh, also seeing uh, a 1.4% growth, probably because of the petrochemical sector recovering a lot of that. Indonesia, meanwhile, minus 1% modestly impacted. And Myanmar at this point, uh, about 1.8%. But we know that the coup that just took place uh, will, uh, will definitely not help matters economically. 
Uh, overall, ASEAN member countries performed relatively well in virus containment, broadly speaking. You have here a map of, of the travel bans, borders closed, and so on uh, in the region. And the supply of food staples has been adequate, but transparency is really, according to this report, uh, key to avoiding panic on the supply side. Uh, the, uh, the transport and border bottlenecks have led to higher costs, and that's well understood. I mean, you've, you've got a situation where uh, there's been an increase in cargo uh, transport costs, 15% up in 2020, and, uh, and, and con concurrent uh, with these volume shortfalls, there's, there's really been, I think, a, a spike in, in freight costs, air freight costs in particular. Uh, there's also been uh, travel restrictions uh, within countries, uh, which have amplified existing health and nutritional disparities and the transaction costs um, that have become impediments to trade have, have been increasing. So we need obviously to look at, at how to in reduce these uh, border impediments and transaction costs. Meanwhile, the suspected, sometimes speculated source of some of these, uh, so, some of the outbreaks, uh, uh, you know, in the form of wet markets and so on, really need to have a, a, the food safety practices revisited. And we understand, of course, that medical and scientific insights can improve facility design. I mean, if you, if you think about livestock farms, uh, slaughter facilities, processing plants and marketplace, uh, marketplaces, there's, there's really a lot that can be done there to prevent transmission. Migrant workers remain vulnerable. We saw that in Singapore with uh, basically a, a, an outbreak contained in migrant worker uh, housing areas. Um, in, the, in the last minute of my talk, I just want to share some of the uh, regional policy guidance that, uh, that, and that's been recommended in that report in terms of immediate, immediate actions recommended, continue with and improve upon effective measures to contain the pandemic, uh, expedite, expedite movements of key agriculture and food inputs, uh, products and people, remove remaining export bans and import barriers, expedite cash transfers to farming households, take preemptive steps to reduce foodborne illnesses uh, in, in agriculture and food value chains, collaborate in assessing how existing commercial operations can lower COVID-19 risks. And uh, there are some short-term recommendations as well as um, a more immediate uh, or rather more long-term recommendations. I'll just skip to them in the last 10 seconds here. Uh, basically expand and extend infrastructure in an inclusive manner to underserved communities, increase interdisciplinary cooperation to improve knowledge, actions, and outcomes, and finally engage in cooperation between governments and private individuals without eroding opportunities, incentives, and responsibility. And that's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Safal for that very insightful presentation on the facts in nationalism. Uh, next, we have Mr. Mark, Mark Milley, um, the Senior Vice President of Policy at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. He managed the production of the Council Information Products, coordinates advocacy efforts across our country and industry committees, and serve as the in-house lead on international trade policy the US, of course. He joined the council uh, in 2003 as the senior director for Malaysia, Philippine and Brunei Affairs, as well as coordinator of the Council ASEAN fin Financial Services Working Group. He was named the vice president in 2010. Mark has over 20 years of experience in international trade and economics. As an international economist with the International Trade Policy Division of USDA Foreign Agricultural Service, as director of the Trade and Investment Program at the African American Institute, and as international economic and foreign policy advisor to Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York, a member of the House Foreign Affairs and Financial Services Committees. Mr. Mili, if you would. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning and good evening uh, for, from Washington and assalamu alaikum to uh, many friends and colleagues in Indonesia. Uh, let me also again thank uh, the Pacific Forum and all the partners at the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. Mission, and of course CSIS for inviting me to participate in this very timely discussion. Um, in thinking about uh, COVID-19's impact uh, on regional trade, I'd like to offer just four points 
which I believe can be relevant uh, to policy discourses uh, in both Indonesia and the United States, uh, and also uh, in relation to uh, US-Indonesia and US-ASEAN relations. Point number one, um, in thinking about national economic recovery policy responses to the economic shocks generated by the pandemic, we know many governments have focused on macroeconomic counter cyclical measures, uh, promoting more economic resilience related measures, and where possible investing in areas which can foster more inclusive and sustainable recovery processes. Of course, while international policies can also play important uh, policy roles uh, in these efforts, I would argue that in the post COVID-19 period, uh, the most important policy area remains the domestic policy environment that will at the end of the day influence international trade competitiveness. By this, I mean policies which build upon human capital and talent, as well as infrastructure, policies which support inclusive processes, enabling more consumers and small businesses to access innovative technologies, and of course, efforts to promote greater resilience in the economy to better respond to economic shocks. For example, Indonesia's uh, government, uh, I salute for the many efforts it has taken to have consultations with stakeholders, including Kadin and Apindo, as well as the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, as the government implements the various elements of the omnibus law, because I believe it will play a significant role in shaping how the domestic business environment enables Indonesian-based companies, small businesses, startup companies, farmers and workers to both recover and to move forward. Second point, while governments and other important stakeholders uh, remain focused on vaccine distribution as well as economic recovery, I think it would be very valuable for governments to identify and incorporate an understanding of some of the new normals that we are seeing sort of in this post COVID environment, particularly in terms of international business. And with such understanding, I believe it can enable governments to be more informed as to the types of new regulations, policies and laws, which can really maximize economic recovery. I think we all understand how COVID-19 has increased the speed of the digitalization of the economies as more people and businesses increase the use of digital tools to produce and consume goods and services. Taking stock how such trends, specifically in terms of how they will drive future forms of innovation in manufacturing, shifts in business models, new trends in foreign direct investment, and how it's influencing international economic policies by other governments should also be important considerations for policymakers and regulators to incorporate into their thinking, into their, their efforts to really put in place the best possible recovery efforts. The government of Indonesia and the US ASEAN Business Council and even the US government, I can tell you, have had numerous dialogues where global companies have been able to highlight how they are adjusting their supply chains and sourcing nodes, and also to discuss what other nations in the region are doing to better position their economies and businesses to take advantage of these types of shifts. For example, in the post-COVID world, one trend that we are beginning to see is that global companies are really increasing the value they place on the resilience of their supply chain and sourcing nodes. And in a sense, how governments demonstrate their capabilities to manage economic shocks, in some ways, 
is becoming a new form of competitive advantage because companies in a sense, global companies are really evaluating the, the efforts, the quality of how governments are able to respond to these challenges in ways that balance the interests of public health as well as economic recovery. Indonesia, like all nations, has its trade challenges, but it also has many opportunities. And I think it's the opportunities that we know that both the Indonesian government as well as the US government really want to focus on in building their relationship forward. Point number three, ASEAN of course has a long history of navigating and learning from economic shocks, like of course the 1997 financial crisis. I believe one lesson to learn from COVID-19 which all societies should look to make as a strategic component in their recovery efforts is to really identify which segments of society and which sectors in the economy were disproportionately negatively impacted by COVID-19. While we know COVID-19 represented a very unique sort of shock to the global economy because of the way it impacted both supply and demand sides of the economies, Understanding which sectors were hurt the most and why can help policymakers better appreciate which aspects of the economy represent weaknesses in terms of economic resilience. I believe such understanding can not only help make sure that recovery efforts address those areas, but can also serve as a guide for strategically targeting future investments and next generation reforms to help those areas to become sources of resilience to future economic shocks, as opposed to sources of weakness. And finally, as the government of Indonesia continues to formulate new rules, laws, regulations, governing the domestic business climate, as well as the investment environment, we believe it's very vital that such national discourses with all aspects of civil society take into account how the Asia Pacific regional economic landscape, particularly in terms of trade and digital economic growth are evolving. No matter how large Indonesia is, and of course it's very significant domestic economy, there is no escape that Indonesia's domestic economic realities are impacted by the frameworks which govern Indonesia's trade and investment relations with other economies, foreign businesses, and investors. And these frameworks are changing. We obviously have been noted how CPTPP represents one of the newer frameworks within the region. We know we see new digital trade agreements that are emerging in the region. We know that RCEP is likely to become uh, go into force potentially before the end of this year or early next year. We know that Indonesia obviously is participating in bilateral preferential trade agreements. And all of these efforts are still taking place in the context of trying to conclude and finish the building of the ASEAN economic community. Again, while all nations face these challenges, Indonesia, we believe, is in a strong position both regionally and globally to think strategically about the industry specific opportunities, it can best leverage as these various frameworks from CPTPP to RCEP all become realities in the Asia Pacific region and begin to influence the trade and investment decisions of market participants, large and small. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe these points are just a few of the potential areas of growth in US-Indonesia bilateral relations. Both nations have often noted that when it comes to the economic aspects of the relationship, there is much more work that needs to be done in the years ahead. I'll stop here and I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meili, for that great presentation. Last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Fajar Hirawan, researcher at the Department of Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia. He has joined CSIS Indonesia in 2006. His research focuses on how to improve the economy in the global world, uh, including uh, 
uh, related to the issue of food security, international trade, creative, the digital economy, uh, small and medium enterprises, rural urban poverty, and uh, other uh, developmental economics issues. Uh, Dr. Hirawan is active in several research networks national, nationally, regionally, and globally. Since 2010, he has taught in several universities in Indonesia, including University of Indonesia, Prasetya Mulia Business School, University of Multimedia Nusantara, and School of Government and Public Policy. As a faculty member at the School of Government and Public Policy, uh, Dr. Hirawan uh, chairs several courses such as macroeconomics, policies for economic development, and Indonesia and in interconnected world. Beside research and teaching activities, he is also very active in public debate related to economic issues through um, workshop, seminars, uh, and media interviews. Um, Dr. Hirawan, uh, you may have the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind introductions, uh, Dr. Fitri. Um, yeah. Okay. This thing is uh, panelists, uh, participants, and all Pacific Forum and CSIS fellows. A very good morning and a very good evening there. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be involved in the Pacific Forum event that will discuss COVID-19 impacts on regional trade and security. Uh, for today's webinar, I would like to share my thought briefly on the impact of COVID-19 on ASEAN trade, especially from Indonesia's perspective. As we have experienced since the beginning of 2020, the COVID-19 has impacted almost all stakeholders and sectors in the economy. It has multiple strikes in the circle flow of income. The pandemic has brought immediate disruptions in economic activities in the global world, like Rob mentioned in the beginning. So particularly in ASEAN, as evident, in the decline in tourism flows, disruption in air travels, and weakening in consumer and business confidence as a result of lockdown, quarantine, stay-at-home orders, temporary business closures, and travel restrictions or prohibitions in most of countries in the world. Due to the pandemic, uh, most of ASEAN strategic partners face a deep contraction or recessions in 2020. You can name it the US, South Korea, European Union and some other ASEAN partners face a recession, where except for China, since they could recover very quickly in the second quarter of 2020. Now let's start to see what happened to China and the US in the last three years, uh, during 2018 to 2020. The data shows that the business confidence index that is also represented by the manufacturing PMI index has started to be positive or in expansion trend since March 2020 in China and July 2020 in the US. The rebound to place when the government uh, has started to ease the lockdown policy. So the gray area there is when the government has started uh, to implement a new normal policy. Meanwhile, the consumer confidence indexes for both countries show a dynamic pattern so it seems during 2020, uh, pessimism in consumption still becomes so critical for both countries to be handled in the midst of pandemic. So since both countries are strategic economic partners for ASEAN, we are always hoping that there will be a positive trend in their business and consumer indexes so that the global economy will start to grow positively, especially trade and investment. So the ASEAN Manufacturing PMI Index figure also shows that ASEAN manufacturing has started to show an e expansion since December 2020, when the value you can see is over 50. Most countries in ASEAN also uh, show the same pattern, except Myanmar, which seems facing a contraction quite late due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, let we identify some data on ASEAN and its partners regarding threat and investment activity before the pandemic up to 2019. So from this table, you can see the value of trading activity between ASEAN and the global world is hovering around 
until 2.8 trillion US dollar. The flow of trade within ASEAN member countries or intra-regional trade market share is maintained by over 20%. And it was followed by the trade between ASEAN and China and between ASEAN and the US. This is why both countries are consistently taking a role as a strategic partner for ASEAN. From the investment point of view, you may see that the US, Japan, the EU, and China are among the top investors in ASEAN. In 2019, the investment share of those four economies has reached more than 40% of the total investment in ASEAN. The intra-ASEAN investment is also significant, uh, hovering around 14 to 18% since 2013. So the global economic recovery momentum into 2020 hopefully could improve the ASEAN market investment performance and then automatically trigger the trading activity within ASEAN and beyond. Moreover, when we intend to examine which sectors that the world and ASEAN strategic partner invest their money in the ASEAN market, from the table you can see that ASEAN is targeted as the manufacturing industry's investment destination. Almost every row, as you can see on the table, you could find manufacturing as the top three investment destination in the ASEAN from their partners. So it might be a signal that ASEAN could become a new production center that could promote the global supply chain and the global production network in the future. And hopefully this signal could continue during and after economic recovery or post pandemic until it could be realized. To conclude my presentations, uh, there are several points that I would like to share as the way forward uh, for the future of regional trade in ASEAN during and post uh, COVID-19. Number one, the recovery momentum in major countries in ASEAN could become a kickoff or a starter for improving the threat intensity between ASEAN and its partners. Number two, nevertheless, uncertainty has to be anticipated by making sure policy consistency related to businesses and consumers is implemented appropriately. We know that there are so many uh, fiscal stimulus that's being implemented by Indonesia and some other ASEAN countries in order to maintain the macroeconomic stability in the region. Number three, the ICT, the information, uh, communication and technology will become the essential sector to promote an innovation-based economy in the region since its growth in 2020 is the highest compared to other sectors. In the case of Indonesia, the ICT sector grew double digit 10.58% in the year of economic contractions. And number four, the last uh, 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 conclusion that I would like to share with, with all of you. So there are likely to be three key priorities uh, for future economic cooperation in the region. So they are re-industrializations, connectivity, and innovation. So in my opinion, ASEAN could promote effective integrations on trade in any arrangements in the form of FTA, in the form of SIPA, uh, uh, or any other uh, forms through those three uh, priorities that I just mentioned. So I will stop there. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Fitri, for your kind uh, uh, introduction and your the opportunity that you gave to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirawan, for the informative uh, presentation on the ASEAN investment dynamic. Uh, we are now in our Q&A session, and I think we have around um, 30 minutes, a little bit less, but I think we can work with that. Um, those are excellent presentation and we have a lot of thoughts on how the COVID impact regional trade and security. Uh, now I would like to uh, share with you how you can ask your question. There's two options for asking question or making comment. One is to raise your hand in the webinar control, which is accessible from the participant tab on the bottom of your screen, and the other is to open the Q&A window. To ask a question, you can type your question into the Q&A box and 
quick send. You can also upvote someone else's question if you want it to be asked. If you raise your hand to ask your question verbally, the host will enable your microphone and ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, so please be ready to unmute yourself and feel, please feel free to ask your question in either English or Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, I would uh, go uh, to the first question that we uh, have today uh, from David G. Carl. Um, I think uh, the question is for Dr. C. Rai, uh, although Mr. McMurley would um, uh, want to answer as well. You're, you're most welcome. The question is, um, the Obama pivot to Asia had quite a mixed record in terms of achievement. Um, Given the prominence in the Biden administration of Obama era veterans, many of whom were closely associated with the pivot, how can Southeast Asian governments take seriously US claims of renewed leadership in regional affairs? Uh, I will first give the opportunity to Dr. C. Rides and then to Mr. Mealy. Well, um, th that's a very wide open question. So, um, so thank you for that question. It's a complicated one. I think we could get into a long discussion about how to measure, how to evaluate the um, outcome of the pivot or rebalance. And um, it would depend a lot on what your metrics are, what you're looking at. Um, a lot of people have looked at this and if you look at the um, uh, engagement to the region, the travel of high level principles um, to meetings in Southeast Asia, for example, um, which um, I, a number of articles have looked at that compared to previous administrations like the Bush administration, uh, subsequent administrations, certainly at the presidential level. Um, I think you can, uh, you can argue that the Obama administration, um, uh, President Obama himself set a very high watermark, which in my experience, as and I should say, I'm I am not a neutral observer of this. I was in the Obama administration, so I I have a lot of biases here. I bring to the table, and I'm I'm not going to uh, pretend I don't. So when I was a part of the Obama administration, and of course we all know what that means. That means when I was traveling in the region as part of the Obama administration, I was talking to officials who probably were telling me what I wanted to hear. So I don't you know I don't pretend otherwise. But you know we heard a lot of appreciation for how much. Um, engagement there was and, um, you know, being uh, engaged on a variety of issues that had never happened before. Um, I myself was involved in negotiations of rotational force posture um, with Australia, the Philippines, um, other countries, Singapore, um, uh, a whole range of things. We, we launched a maritime security initiative, uh, you know, the designated new uh, funding authorities out of Congress, um, that was uh, continued um, under the Trump administration. Um, uh, we, I think there was, a, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of setting of expectations, um, which included setting of expectations in, um, you know, trying to change the frame, including within Congress, about where our strategic priorities uh, lay. Um, at the same time, one can look, and many studies have looked at how much was the rebalance resourced in, in developmental um, programs, um, in uh, security cooperation programs and in, in a whole range of other things. And there the results were rather meager. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, so uh, anyway, the point is we can go on and on about this. China was pushing hard on, you know, uh, uh, dumping uh, sand on artificial islands and, and, and doing things that caught the Obama administration on the back foot and uh, uh, responding to that quickly and adroitly with, uh, in a complicated environment was, was complicated. So we could have a long, we could have a whole session on that. Um, but I think the, the things to say are, um, I think there was a lot of appreciation for at least a level of engagement. Uh, we can have a debate on the achievements and uh, certainly Obama did not get, the Obama team did not get TPP over the finish line before he, the, the, he left office. And that was a big, um, that was a big loss. Um, uh, because TPP was a centerpiece of the rebalance and that is now a big, you know, vacuum. Um, I think there were a lot of lessons learned um, in terms of dealing with China, um, especially in kind of South China Sea type of issues, um, including, uh, you know, in this team. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Thank you, Dr. C. Right. Uh, I believe in the chat, uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Mealy uh, would like to answer as well. And I think if you don't mind answering uh, the question about um, 
the whether Obama, uh, whether President Biden administration will be seen as Obama version 2.0, mm-hmm. as well as if I may continue uh, the question for Mr. McMilly from uh, Mr. Amirud Krishna Kumar. Uh, are there any security risks in the US joining multilateral trade agreements like the TPP as opposed to pursuing a strategy of bilateral trade relation with individual countries? So, so maybe you can uh, answer those two questions. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I think for the first question, um, and this is a conversation that I think is playing out both in the United States right now, but also in the region, um, which many have said, you know, with so many officials in the Biden administration that were former members of the uh, Obama administration, that that's a positive thing. Um, At the same time, uh, you know, the reality is the world today is not the same as it was in 2015 and 2016, uh, when many of those officials uh, worked uh, in the US government. The world has changed here in 2021. Um, I think in terms of an, from an economic engagement uh, point of view, which is partly tied to security, but is also uh, distinct in terms of the nature of how you would engage. Um, I think there is a need um, for efforts and investments which help to rebuild a sense of trust and help to rebuild confidence uh, in the United States government uh, as a trusted economic partner. I think those are the types of things that just because certain individuals are working in the government today who once worked in the U.S. government five or six years ago, Um, That's a nice thing to have, but in itself uh, does not uh, take away from the need to re-earn trust and rebuild confidence. The second uh, question I think is is a very interesting one. It is uh, the question of can the Biden administration rejoin CPTPP? Can it uh, seek admission into RCEP? Um, I think two things are very clear. Number one, because of the domestic political realities that the Biden administration is coming into today, it is probably not politically conducive for the administration in the short term to say we want to rejoin CPTPP or we want to seek a process to do a new free trade agreement with Asia, et cetera, et cetera. I think the domestic politics in the United States will have to take some time to further evolve before they would be a bit more conducive uh, for for that type of effort. And I think the the key thing from a trade competitive perspective between joining or participating in multilateral efforts uh, versus bilateral efforts um, is really fundamentally a question of how do some of our trade partners prioritize participating in multilateral efforts versus bilateral efforts? While we all know there are probably some countries in ASEAN that would entertain perhaps uh, entering into a bilateral uh, negotiation with the United States, the reality is many countries in ASEAN are already participating in a number of both multilateral as well as bilateral uh, preferential trade initiatives and negotiations. So we oftentimes hear there's a question of prioritizing uh, these these opportunities. And unlike the United States, um, not every country has the ability to negotiate Uh, two or three different types of agreements at the same time. Most countries have to prioritize these types of of efforts because politically they can be very challenging. So I think that's a question that that the U.S. uh, will have to figure out in talking with some of its trade partners uh, as to what their preferences are as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mealy. Uh, I would turn to Professor Safal Ear for academic, you know, easily, um, uh, um, you know, more neutral comment on, on the previous uh, question that has been asked. How do you see uh, the Southeast Asian countries sees um, uh, the uh, President Biden administration? And uh, also, uh, you have a question that I think directed uh, to you and perhaps uh, other uh, panelists can also answer later. Uh, the question is, can we expand trade and remove barrier to trade uh, as well as protect public health as the pandemic wind down? Uh, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank uh, you. Um, well, on, on the Biden administration's credibility, I agree that it's, it's really difficult uh, after all the um, whiplash of the last four years to to be able to say let's just return to where things were right let's just return to normalcy in terms of our relationship with ASEAN let's have the kind of partnership that was envisaged earlier when of course you know even under the Obama administration there were there were the criticism immediately when we called it the, when they called it the pivot to Asia was that as you could pivot one way, you could pivot another way. You can just turn away from, from ASEAN once again, but uh, then it was the rebalance. And, and of course the, the language that's were a matter of semantics, but, but I, think, I think with the Biden administration, I, I, would, I would echo what's been said in terms of uh, look at the actions before uh, judging the words uh, and, and look at who is visiting and who is is paying attention. And I, I think at the senior levels of the administration, that attention is being paid. Of course, you have some of the same characters. You have Kurt Campbell, who um, is the architect of, of the pivot, right? And he's, he's again, the Asia czar for the Biden administration. So, so that's, that's both, I suppose, reassuring if you think it's going to be a return to the, to the, to the Obama days of, of, of viewing things or whether it, it might be you know, more of the same from, from four years earlier. But um, I'll leave it at that. And, in, and I'm sorry, in terms of the, the question you posed on trade, um, let me look at the question in the list here. Um, I'm sorry, can you recap the question or repeat uh, it? Yeah, sure. Um, can we expand trade and remove barriers to trade to protect public health as the pandemic okay. winds down? Right. Um, well, I, I think the, the main impediment uh, has been, you know, the phytosanitary, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, making sure that, that when you trade, you're not transmitting diseases through the goods that you trade. So if it's, if it's going to be livestock, for example, that's, that's always the, the highest risk because you, you think that, that that livestock could, could bring a new disease into your country. And so these standards, and you, you can make one mistake. And of course, you know, the disease is, is it within your borders, but but uh, I think as as we increase confidence in 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 um, in vaccinations, especially uh, vaccines that are effective uh, and um, are safe, um, and and you know work towards herd immunity, this is where people will eventually feel that they can return to a kind of not normal, not the way before, but at least. Uh, in a you know more in a field safer towards the the types of uh, interactions that they had before, whether that's tourism with vaccine passports, whether it's uh, in terms of trade with uh, returning the the to the levels of of trade in the past. Of course, you have to have the demand for it. I mean, if if for example a country like Cambodia, of which I am an expert, uh, exports garments. Um, it has to have, you know, garment buyers to to make the orders. And if the country is under lockdown, it's not going to operate the factories at the levels that it was before. And of course, if it wasn't getting the, the same levels of orders, it's also not going to operate. It's not it's not going to be able to benefit in the same way in terms of exports, uh, whether to the United States or the EU or to the UK that it enjoyed previously. But at, at least I think that with goods like garments, uh, inanimate object, certainly, there isn't as much, there isn't going to be the fear of transmission of disease. It's, it's always with something to do with, with food, something you eat, something that is, um, that is possibly going to enter your body that you feel that this is a risk that cannot be borne if, if there is detected virus uh, on, the, on the goods themselves. 
Thank you, Professor Sofal Ir. Um, I will turn to Dr. Pajar Hirawan. Uh, if you would like to answer the previous question uh, uh, posed, you can. But I have uh, this question uh, from uh, Rocky Intan. Uh, to you. Uh, it reads, the Biden administration is understandably focused on domestic affairs and foreign trades agreement. Uh, it will take time to get through Congress. What are the lower hanging fruits of an economic cooperation program that the US and ASEAN can achieve in short term, especially related to the economic recovery? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fitri. Uh, thank you, Rocky, for the question. So I believe that, you know, like as I uh, mentioned to you before, you know, like uh, we know that the U.S. is the one of the uh, strategic uh, partners uh, in trade and investment for ASEAN. And I believe that, you know, like this potential have to be maintained, you know, like in the future. And I believe that, you know, when we are talking about the by, whether it is Biden or Trump administrations, you know, like, of course, there is a, hopefully, you know, like uh, ASEAN community, um, uh, give a, you know, like a, a, a positive a response or positive uh, a gestures, you know, like, uh, and they uh, uh, have a high expectations with the new administration and hopefully, you know, like uh, the ASEAN and the US uh, economic cooperation could be strengthened, you know, like, uh, and, and for me, you know, like when we are talking about uh, the lower hanging fruit, I believe that we, we should optimize what we have right now. So I know that some of the uh, uh, ASEAN member uh, countries, uh, especially Indonesia, have the uh, uh, facility like a GSP, and I think we should uh, uh, optimize that uh, facility. And as you already know, that I think in case of Indonesia, we only uh, utilize the GSP facility less than twenty uh, percent. So I think that's the one that you know, like uh, we have to optimize. And when we are talking about uh, whether we could remove the barriers or uh, we could improve, you know, like uh, the economic cooperation, especially in public health. I believe that, you know, as long as we have the same value, as long as we have the same visions, how to make uh, 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 the global world uh, uh, more uh, uh, prosper and more health, uh, healthier, I can say that, you know, like uh, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, like since the public health also become an agenda for the uh, G20 uh, in Italy as a president of G20 uh, in 2020 uh, this year, I believe that, you know, like as long as we have a same vision, we have a same value that we would like to promote, that we have to promote the, uh, 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 the good, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the, the good uh, f uh, ex uh, uh, performance of our uh, public health, especially in ASEAN, I, I think we, 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 we should uh, promote and we should, we should uh, concern on, on that. So I think I will stop there, Dr. Fitri. Uh, thank you, Fajar. Um, I, uh, I would like uh, to uh, now turn to Dr. Ami C. Wright uh, to answer the previous question if you if you have um, any um, uh, comment on how to uh, as, as the pandemic wind down whether we can uh, remove trade barriers um, but also uh, protecting public health but uh, a question that I think uh, would be suitable to address to you Dr. C. Wright is can a Biden administration promote democracy and regional integration at the same time, look at understanding how the this Southeast Asia region look like now uh, with democracy, it's uh, being challenged with populism and perhaps military coup. Yeah, um, sure. I think I, I think they can. I think um, there's. Uh, I think that. Um, you know, I think I think the United States has long stood for democratic norms and human rights, and the Biden administration wants to elevate democracy promotion um, um, and work with other democracies um, to try to support democratic norms and challenges facing democracies. Um, I think that is a laudable um, 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 effort. And I think that if, if you know, it, it, it does come with some, you know, some pitfalls if it's not done carefully. 
but I think they are thinking through how to do it carefully because obviously Asia is not the only region in the world, but um, Asia is a region, Southeast Asia and other parts of the Indo-Pacific, you know, is a region that has a number of countries that are, you know, friends, partners with the United States, but they are not full-fledged democracies or they're democracies that have experienced some backsliding um, or some problems. And, you know, the United States, of course, over the last few years has, has had its own problems in terms of um, some flaws in um, the health of our democracy. And, you know, Biden and his, his team are, are well aware of that as well. And so, you know, it's a time to be humble, but to, uh, but to also recognize the challenge facing democracies, including our own democracy um, internally, but also from external models of authoritarianism and disinformation and, um, uh, you know, um, surveillance technologies and um, uh, 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 bad uh, cyber surveillance and um, other things that are that are that are challenges. And so I think working together on those kinds of things makes a lot of sense. And I don't see that as necessarily going against working with ASEAN and other partners uh, to promote regional economic integration and cooperation on a, a broad array of transnational challenges as well. If I could just other, say uh, two other just quick things um, uh, about the previous discussion about um, uh, whether or not the, the, the United States can get back to trade agreements, um, whether the United States can join multilateral trade agreements like uh, CPTPP. Um, you know, I, I think that um, it is politically difficult, and I, I'm not predicting that the Biden administration will be able to do it in the near term. But I just want to point out, since I did my presentation focusing on surveys of, of public opinion, American public opinion is strongly in favor of free trade and free trade agreements. So it's a political problem, meaning it's a problem of political parties. Um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party right now are kind of upside down in terms of where they are on the question of trade agreements. But the public, including the Democratic voters, um, are in favor of TPP still and in favor of globalization. And Republicans used to be pro-free trade, and then they've gotten upside down after Trump became their leader and was sort of anti-free trade. And so this has to get sorted out. But I do think that there is um, a popular support if it can be put together under real political leadership. Uh, and so I think if there was a big and bold um, uh, coalition uh, and a strategy um, uh, it, uh, that it, it should and could be uh, played at some at some point. Um, and I'll, I have a lot of other things to say about this conversation, but uh, I've used my time, so I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Sira. I like your enthusiasm. I see a hand from Professor Ear, uh, especially maybe expert on democracy or maybe Southeast Asian style right. of democracy. Well, I, I just wanted to follow up very quickly on, on, the, on the point that Dr. Seawright made, which is, which is that, you know, I, I, the United States has gone through a period where, you know, we had the, the January 6 Capitol uh, uh, riots, we had, we've had uh, Black Lives Matter protests. And I, th I think that if, if one looks at, at the trajectory or the experience, it can both uh, be traumatic in terms of seeing the, the damage to our democracy, but I think it also provides hope that as, you know, uh, uh, um, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, said, "You know, we're 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 working still towards a perfect union, and and that means we're not a perfect union yet. We we are not perfect, and and we have to go through you know the travails and challenges that we've faced. And and I think it provides still inspiration to countries that are still on that journey themselves, and and can see that even with Black Lives Matter protests, that's part of." rectifying problems that that haven't been solved you know since slavery right so so it, it, civil war etc cetera, etc cetera, we're still dealing with a lot of that legacy and i think it still show it shows that um, we're not out there saying you know we've figured it all out and we're perfect but that we want to try to fix the problems and that we can at least deal with them and i think that that provides hope for for countries that that see that experience, or, or at least for social movements that would like to bring more democracy to their countries if those countries are autocratic, for example. 
Thank you, Professor Safal Ear. I have uh, two questions that I want to rush, I guess, if I may. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, uh, read the question. First is uh, for Dr. Fajar Hirawan. What explains the resilience of consumer confidence in the US, China, and especially Southeast Asia? Is technology su sufficient to explain it? And I hope you can answer it uh, in 30 seconds after this. And then I will uh, um, read the question for Mark Maley. Uh, Mr. Maley, please explain more about the evolution of national discourses on trade and the digital economy. How do you see these discourses evolving and where do you think they're heading? Uh, okay, I will give the opportunity to uh, for uh, Dr. Hirawan for 30 seconds before I turn to Mr. Emil. Please. Thank you, Dr. Fitri. I think, I think the, uh, the most important thing is the policy consistency. I think in the beginning, you know, like uh, of pandemic, I think you know, most of the uh, uh, countries have a, a serious problem how to you know implement the policy to you know like uh, uh, to stop the spread of the virus you know like uh, and for me you know like in order to uh, uh, boost or to improve uh, the consumer confidence you know like uh, to uh, uh, increase the, the 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 optimism in the consumer i think we have to have a i mean the government have to have a policy consistency you know like uh, and then not changing every month or every day. So I think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a must. And uh, the second question is technology sufficient to explain it. So for me, I think, you know, like we know that there is like a, a massive or significant increase of the ICT sector during the pandemic uh, due to the uh, uh, limitations of the mobility uh, of the people. So I believe that, you know, like uh, technology itself is not sufficient. And I believe that we also have to promote uh, of course, the infrastructure itself and also, you know, like the literacy uh, for the uh, uh, community and for the people. I think uh, that's my response, Fitri. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mealy, I hope. Yeah, in, in, in 30 seconds, I would agree with all of those points uh, that Hiramwan, you have raised. To me, the key is governments and other key stakeholders finding balance in how they approach law, policy regulation so that innovation is fostered, but also access. And of course, things like consumer protections and privacy rights are also baked into the system. So again, it's the balance, not leaning too far to one side or the other, which oftentimes happens in national discourses around the future of digital economies. Thank you, Mr. Um, Miller. Thank you, all panelists. You have been brilliant. I will uh, return uh, the screen to uh, Rob because I'm uh, late by one minute. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Fitri. And thank you to all of our esteemed panelists and participants who've joined us today. We were unable to get to everyone's questions, all the great questions that we received, but we hope that this is the beginning of a dialogue on this subject. And we hope that you will continue to remain engaged with us and our programming, which you can find out more about at Pacific Forum's website, www.pacforum.org. Now that all of our speakers have finished, we have a poll for our audience. Here is the question. What should be the priority for Southeast Asian economies in 2021? Promoting regional trade, promoting economic recovery in their own country, promoting public health or pandemic recovery, or limiting the negative effects of the US-China rivalry. Okay. While we are waiting for those poll results, I'll remind those in attendance that we also have a survey that we would like you to complete after the event concludes. Please find the link to the survey in the chat box now. We hope that you will return for the fourth session of this series, which is to be announced which will cover disinformation, also known as misinformation or fake news. The spread of social media and thinly sourced unverified news online has prompted concerns from nations around the world, the United States and Indonesia included, about disinformation and its social effects. This includes behavioral changes, the degradation of trust in public institutions, and will be 
compounding the effects and the difficulties of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, including through the spread of false information about the virus's origins, the public health measures needed to respond to it, and the overall danger of the virus. Now with vaccine rollout underway, this issue is of even greater importance. So please stay tuned for more details, including the date and time. And now let's take a look at our poll results. All right, our winner is promoting public health and pandemic recovery with 55%. Following that, promoting economic recovery in their own country comes in second at 28%. And then we get promoting regional trade at 14 in conclusion, limiting the negative effects of the U.S.-China rivalry is at 3%. Right. I'd like to remind you of the post-event survey, which we'll share again, which we have shared again in our chat box. We would really appreciate it if you can take a few minutes to fill it out, complete it, and share it with us. If you have not done so already, this is the third in a series of nine sessions, and we want to make them as engaging and productive for all of us, for everyone. Thank you to our speakers once again for joining us today, to our partner, CSIS, and especially Petrie, as well as to the U.S. Embassy Jakarta for making this event possible. We hope that we will see you again at our next events in this series. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.